Hallelujah. All right, now, uh, oh, this is church. I thought this was the gym where I could come and get my, get my workout on. Huh? Yeah, you better watch it, boy. Better watch it. Better watch it now. I still got something. I still got something in the tank. I don't know what's in the tank, but I still got something. <laughs> so let me ask you now. How many of y'all have some exercise clothes? Oh, some of you got some exercise clothes. Okay. How many of you thought about exercising? Okay. Some of you don't thought about it. Okay. Okay. How many of you talked about exercising? Okay. Everybody. Okay. So now, how many of you really, 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 really exercising? All day. Every day. Every day. Okay. Yeah. I thought it would change then. Yeah. Got about three or four hands up now. Yeah. Yeah. Now, why is it? that we talk about it, we got clothes, we even think about it, uh, but we really don't do it. You know, exercising, it serves a purpose for the body, but it also serves a purpose for our souls. And as we've been going through this series here, uh, Between a Rock and a Hard Place, uh, we've traveled through the first 29 verses of chapter 14, but today we're going to really look at why did God do all of this? Why did he allow the children of Israel to go through what they went through? And so if you would, open your Bibles to the book of Exodus as we're finishing up here. And um, if you don't have a Bible, uh, pull it down on a, a very good app called YouVersion. And we're going to look at verses uh, 30 and 31, which will actually complete this whole chapter. And we've actually walked through uh, this entire chapter over the last six or seven weeks. And the translation that I like to come from is um, the NIV. And there we find these words. That day, the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. When they saw, no, it's saved them from the hands of the Egyptians. And, they, and, the, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the seashore. Is that what it says? All right, saw him lying dead on the shore, I believe. And then now verse 31 goes on to say, um, what does verse 31 say? And when, well, look at this now. And when they saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, look what happens now. They feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. I, I want to talk to you about exercising your faith. Now, oftentimes when we have uh, life come at us, uh, most of us, now I wouldn't say all of us, but most of us want to get through whatever we're going through so we can get back to doing what we were doing. Y'all didn't hear that, right? When life comes at you, most of us want to get through what we were doing so we can get, get through what we're going through so we can get back to doing what we were doing. Newsflash, God doesn't waste a hurt. God doesn't waste an experience. And so when you are going through something, you have to figure that God is trying to teach us something. And this is what was happening to the children of Israel. Now, y'all remember we've gone through uh, the, the last five or six weeks, and there's some things that God has helped them to learn so far. Uh, and we've learned some principles, and I've told you that these principles only apply, uh, or best apply for those who are what? God, those who are believers and those who are in God's will. Now, the first rule that we saw that God taught the children of Israel was one, that they were exactly where God wanted them to be. If you're in God's will and you're doing what God has called you to do uh, and life comes at you, then you can just sort of uh, rejoice a little bit. And we're going to talk about that because it's not always easy uh, when you're going through something. But if you're in God's will and life comes at you, chances are you're where God wants you to be. That's your first rule. The second rule is that you need to acknowledge that you do have an enemy. You know, don't, you don't need to walk around like, a, the, you know, that he's not there and he's not real. No, the enemy is real. All right? So you need to acknowledge you have an enemy, right? But we need to keep our eyes on the Lord. Is that not correct? 
All right. And then the next thing is after you do that, when things start getting really turbulent, uh, we need to know how to what, stay calm and have confidence and give God room to work. Now, here's the next one that becomes really, really difficult because if, if any of you are like me, I'm a planner and I like to try to figure out what's going to happen next. And, and that may not always be the case. You may not be able to see how everything's going to unfold. So when you can't see how everything's going to unfold, then what you need to do is to, when you're unsure, you just need to take the next logical faith step. You know, God may not show you how everything's going to turn out. How many of you like to just know how everything's going to turn out? Yeah, you just, yeah, but he may not show you all of that. So the only thing you, may, you can do is take the next logical step. And then here's one that we spend a little time on that I still don't think we have grasped, but hopefully a little bit today we'll get a little deeper on that. Then we have to envision God's enveloping presence. And what do I mean by that? A lot of times, have you ever said, I just don't feel like the Lord's with me. I just don't feel right. It just, uh, we operate a lot on feelings, but the Bible tells us we also need to operate on facts. If God says he will never leave you nor forsake you, then you don't have to worry about if you feel his presence or not. In fact, here's, here's something to remember. God may be silent, but he's never absent. That, that ought to be some good news for you. That he, he, he may not be speaking to you, and you may not feel his presence, but guess what? God is never absent. That's why we can take those words that he will never leave you nor forsake you, and you can just hold on to that, even when it doesn't look like he's right there with you. Are y'all walking with me that far? <clears throat> and then uh, we, we learned on last week that we are to trust him to do, to, for him to work in his own unique way. How many of you like a, everything to be just a cookie cutter? Uh, see, I like a customized God. I like a God who's going to make things work out for me. You know, you got your situation and you got your situation. And you got yours and you got your. He's not a one size fit all kind of God. Well, he, he's going to tailor make your situation so that if you follow him, he can work it out. That's why no two sunsets are alike. No two flowers are alike. No two leaves are alike. Not even two blades of grass are the same. Why? Because we serve a God that deals in being unique. He's the creator and he can create things just especially for you and for you and for you and for you. Isn't that just an awesome thing to see? And so now, at, 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 on last week, we observed the children of Israel walking through the Red Sea. Do y'all remember that? He parted the waters, and you remember the fish were looking at you, and you were looking at the fish, and they went through the sea with the walls of the water on both sides, and those walls that could have been their enemy became their ally, and that wall that could have caused them to perish became the one that protected them. And here they are now. They're on the other side where God had promised them. Remember, when we started this lesson, God told him he was going to do two things. He said he was going to gain his glory right over the Egyptians, and he was going to take them into the promised land. God has told you the same thing. Y'all don't believe it. You're going to get to the promised land. But now the problem is, that's the problem. I got a problem, and it doesn't seem like my problem is going to let me get in to the promised land. And because of my problem, I become concerned and confused, and I even cry out and complain to the Lord. Do y'all remember the children of Israel? If you go back and read verses 10 through 13, they thought it was better to stay in Egypt than to be out in the desert. They thought it was better to be slaves than to be free. They, they were concerned that God wasn't more powerful than their problem, so they were willing to give into their problem and just accepting, well, it's just going to have to be that way. I mean, I just can't get out of this. It's, it's, you know, that's just my lot. That's just my fate. That's just the way it's going to be. Well, for some teams, that is just the way it's going to be, and I'm not going to talk about that, but, but you just have to accept your fate. All right, so now walk with me here. Now, 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 let's look at the first thing that we learned this week. The first thing we learned this week is that the Lord freed uh, the, the children of Israel. The Lord freed the Israelites. Look what he says. It says, that day. Now, that's for some of you all, that doesn't sound like a powerful thing. But everybody who's going through something is looking for that day. Some of you want that day right now, don't you? You want that day when you say that the Lord saved me from something. Notice now, is they didn't free themselves. And, and that word 
saved there. Some of your Bibles might say rescue. Some of your Bibles might say the salvation of the Lord delivered them. Some of your Bibles might say the deliverance of the Lord. But that word in the Hebrew means that they were rescued from something by someone. And the Bible tells us who they were rescued by and what they were rescued from. And some of you need to be rescued from some things and you cannot do it yourself. Uh, so most of the time, no, all the time, God's going to make your problem so big that you can't solve your problem by yourself because he can't get the glory until he knows that you know that you know that you know that it was nobody but the Lord that was the one that pulled you through. Oh, I'm not talking to anybody here other than myself. You see, I, I, I have been in some situations and I have seen myself looking death in the face and did not know how I was going to get out. And if it wasn't for the Lord who showed up and showed up on my behalf, I would not be standing here to be able to tell you how to exercise your faith. Come on now, somebody here, somebody here. <clears throat> Your faith is weak here, so I'm trying to loosen you up here. Y'all need to stand up with me. Come on, stand up and stretch with me. We need to learn how to exercise our faith. God, has God delivered anybody in here from something other than me? Because there ought to be somebody that just can wave their hand and just thank God for he has freed you from something. Notice now, notice now. Keep standing. I want you to see this part here. I need you to stretch a little bit on this right here. Notice he says now that the Lord freed them from the hands of the Egyptians. You ought to put a line up under that because that word hand has some, has some implications. The word hands, when you see it connected to someone or to something in the Hebrew, it means someone who has control over you, someone who has authority over you, someone who has possession over you, or something. And see, some of us have been in the hands of the Egyptians. The Egyptians represent your enemy. Whatever has had you in bondage, whatever, whether it was a drug addiction, it had you. Whether it was, whether it was your body or your mind that wasn't well, it had you. Maybe it was in your finances. They were broken. You were broke because the enemy had their hands on your finances. Maybe it was on your family. Mothers and fathers, you've been praying for a child that's been out there in the world and the enemy's got their hands on your children. They got control and authority and power over them. Maybe you're in a sordid affair that you've been trying to break yourself out of and you, someone's got their hands, got control and they've got authority and possessions over you. You can sit down now. You, you ought to be a little loose now. Yeah, yeah. Hmm, yeah. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, you don't do that if you don't know how to do that. Tomorrow if y'all see me like this. <laughs> Walk with me now. Walk with me. Look at this now. Look at this. God saved them from the hands of their enemy. But now if you go back and remember, just look, remember verses 10 through 13, if I'm calling them correctly. The Israelites were there crying out against Moses for bringing them out of Egypt. They were, they were crying out and, in fact, wanted to go back into a bad relationship. Uh, they had forgotten about how they had been abused and how, how their children had been taken from them and how their livestock had been taken from them and how their young ladies had been raped and live, had to live in the house with the Egyptian and their young sons had been uh, murdered and some of them had been worked to death. Uh, they forgot out about how all of these bad things had happened and all they were talking about are the good meals that they could eat. Sometimes, do you know when you're in a bad situation, you can't see clearly? You, 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 you know, you, you wonder why you got out of it, but then when things look worse than they did when you were in it, you, you figure sometimes it's better to go back to that because where you're going looks so much more difficult that maybe you made a mistake. Have you ever thought that to yourself, that you, you, you got out of a bad deal? Maybe it's a bad job you had. Maybe it was a bad relationship. Maybe, maybe it was some bad financial decisions you made, and when you got out of it, it seems like things got worse instead of better. Anybody ever been there? And, and when, when that happens, you start doubting yourself and wondering if you've made the right decision. This is where they were. And in fact, they were so afraid of the Israelites, they told Moses it would be better for us to serve the, Israel, uh, the Egyptians than for us to die in Egypt. I mean, in the wilderness. Look now, look now. Why were they so afraid of the, Israel, of the Egyptians versus God? Hmm. Hmm. 
We're going to get to that in just a moment, but I just need you to see here what, 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 what is happening here. Now, notice now it says that the Lord freed them. Now, if you don't remember anything else, God freed them. Uh, you are freed by God for God. That's your life advice. You are freed by God for God. You say, well, what are you talking about, Pastor? Now, I got to jump ahead because this is the last day of the series. And, oh, I forgot to tell y'all, we still got a few uh, books and a few T-shirts. And I'm going to actually throw this one today because I'm loosening up because it's the last day. I see folks getting ready for them. Look at, now, let's see. Y'all want to see? Last time I showed you how far I could throw, right? This week I need to show you I can throw a strike. See, last, last time I was throwing from left field to home plate, and, and, and I got him out. Now, this, this time I need to be able to throw a strike. Let's see if, let me see if I can throw a strike. Right to the man. Did you get it, bro? That's who I was throwing it to. Yes, look at that. That's a strike. I, that's you. That's for you, my brother. That's for you. All right. See, y'all didn't think I could do that. Now, who doesn't have this book yet? All right. Good. Go buy one. No. <laughs> Raise your hand again. Who doesn't have one? Okay. Okay. Come on. Right here. Right here. You, there you go. There. All right. <laughs> but they, they still got a few more left. Now, if you're a first-time guest, if you go to the uh, newcomers gathering, they've got a free book for you out there. So just make certain that when they give you the call at the end of service, if you'll make your way out there, that's one of the gifts that they're going to give you. I think we also probably have a, a gift certificate to Chick-fil-A or, or Starbucks, but that's for, the, for those of you who've never been. Even if you've been here four or five times and you've never been to the gathering, go. So now, where was I? We were free by God, by the Lord, for the Lord, right? Now, I say I got to jump ahead here. Let me just uh, tell you why. Turn to uh, Exodus, the 19th chapter. Can I teach just a little bit today? How much more time I got? Okay, about another hour. Okay. All right, go to chapter 19, and please come out on, on Wednesday. Uh, we're going to be wrapping it up, and we're going to have some Q&A, and uh, we're going to close this series out very strong. So come out on Wednesday at uh, noon or in, in the evening at uh, 6 o'clock where we do dinner. And you can catch next Sunday. Uh, if you miss any of that, they'll do it next Sunday. Now, if you look at Exodus, the uh, 19th chapter, verses 4 through 6, it tells us there that God told them that that he freed them for a reason and that he told them in those verses that he, he said, do you remember why I saved you and how I saved you? And then he goes on to tell them that they are something special. How many of you want to be something special? Yeah, yeah. And notice now, he said, out of all the nations, all right, out of all the nations, he freed them and chose them. Say, I'm chosen. It, oh, see, yeah, you, you know, yeah, isn't that good to be chosen? Yeah, God, God selects. He doesn't settle. He, you know, he doesn't settle for what he wants. He chose us as being his own. And so because of that now, he's going to tell them later, and I'm going to talk about this later in, in chapter uh, 20, why they should live like they should live. So God has chosen you. He has saved you for a reason. He needs some representatives to, for folks to be able to tell other folks that I know a God who sits high and looks low. I I know a God who has all power in heaven and on earth. He says that I know a God that can do anything but fail. And so in this freeing them, he says, see what I have done for you. Isn't that what he says there? And so now watch this. Now go ahead on and read that passage later. Just put that one down. I want you to look at this is why I'm telling you that you're freed by God for God or you're freed by the Lord for the Lord. God just doesn't set you free for you to keep going back to what you were doing. And if you keep going back through the same things over and over again, Again, you know what God said? You haven't learned your lesson yet. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to ramp it up and things going to have to get so worse. Some of us are like this. Now, this is how I used to be. I know some of you need to be hit with a two by four over the head before you get it, right? I was worse than that. Mine needed a nail in it. Bam, it needs to stick right there. Bam, you know, when I got hit. But once I got hit with God's two by four, I, he ain't had to hit me no more. I'm straight to go. Yes, indeed. One, one, yeah, once you get it, you got it. And when you, some of you haven't gotten it yet because you're still trying to get it. Watch this now. Walk with me. Walk with me. So now he said that the Lord freed them from the hands of the Israel, uh, from the Egyptians. What did he do next? Now it says the Is Israel saw, look here now, this is where some of you need to be, saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shores. That's your problem, y'all. 
Notice now, when, when, when you see your problem lying dead, that means it can't hurt you anymore. What can dead folks do to you? What can dead things do to you? When something is dead, it, you may be able to see it, you may be able to touch it, but it has no more power or authority over you. So, so whatever it is in your life, whatever your enemy is, God can take it out for you, and you can look right at it, and when it is dead, you don't have to worry about it being able to do you any more harm. It, it, your problem is dead. So in other words, they saw their problems. Remember, they were running from the Egyptians. They kept saying they wanted to go back and serve the Egyptians. The very people that they were afraid of, they saw dead. Their very problem, they saw dead. How many of you got some problems that you need to just see them dead, that you need God just to put them on the shore so you can sit there and look at And this is the very thing you were afraid of. Do you see that? The very thing that they were telling Moses that they wanted to go back and serve is now dead. Now, what was the lesson that God wanted them to learn? He told them two things. He was going to do what? Gain his glory over Pharaoh and his army, and he was going to take them into the promised land. Now, he's already completed one. He's gained his glory over Pharaoh. I can imagine Pharaoh seeing all his, his army lying dead on the shore. It, in fact, the children of Israel had, didn't have to worry about the Egyptians anymore, that they never had any more problems out of the Egyptians. Now, watch this now. Now, so we're going to look at the lesson that God wants them to learn and wants us to learn. God wants us to learn to fear him. That's your second point there. You're to learn to fear the Lord. Watch this now. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. They, they learn to fear the Lord. It says now, when they saw them lying dead on the shore. Isn't that what the text tells you there? It says they saw, the hand, they saw the hand of the Lord displayed, didn't it? No, it says the mighty hand. Mighty. That word mighty there means of great power, of exceeding power. And notice now in verse 30, it told you you had the hands of the Egyptians. Y'all ain't catching this. I said, what does that mean? Whoever has control authority and possession of you now he's, they see the mighty hand just one hand right they had the hands of the egyptian but now you got the mighty hand of the lord now what he's saying here this word mighty is saying that he was stronger than whatever their problem was that he was mightier than whatever they were facing that what they were looking at is now dead and he's got more power over your circumstances and over your situation and all you got to do is recognize it. So once they saw that the Egyptians were dead, they now recognize that word saw means that they learned, that they understood, they had comprehended what God has done. Sometimes we have not learned what God has done in our lives, so we have to keep going through these things over and over. But once you have learned it, the first thing God wanted us, them to learn and us to learn is that we need to fear the Lord. Now, now here's where most of us have a problem. I would say that most of us don't have an accurate fear of God. That there's at least two kinds of fear that most of us are faced with. There's punitive fear. That's the fear of punishment. How many of you don't want to get punished? Oh, just a few. Some of you like punishment. Y'all are sadistic people. You just like, like to be cut up, beaten, spanked. How many of you don't like to get punished? How many of you like punishment? Don't, don't raise your hand. That's a, please, please, please don't raise your hand on that. Notice now, notice now, notice now. There's two kinds of fear, all right? Punitive fear. That's what keeps most of us in check. That's why most of you pay your, your taxes, your income tax. You don't pay your taxes because you love your government. You're fearful that they'll come take your stuff. You see, they got commercials on it, right? Optimum tax, call them, community tax. They, they'll get you out of that bind. You hear those folks talking about, you know, I was $10,000 or $20,000. I owed the federal government, and I was afraid they were going to take my house. They are going to garnish my way, and they will. I know from experience. That's right. Now, they, they, they'll call you, too, at whatever hour they want to. They'll show up at your house. You go to the bank and they already got your money for you got your money. 
They, 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 they'll do that. So we're afraid of them. Some of us, you know, you try to get away a few times, but once they get you one time, uh-uh. <laughs> Because we're afraid, right? Most of us only speed fast enough not to get a ticket. You know it. You call it going with the flow. You know when you're on the interstate, you want to go with the flow, right? The speed limit says 55. You're doing 80. Why? Because everybody else doing 85. You figure, no, they got to get them first. No, they don't. I learned that one too. <laughs> yes, indeed. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, see, there, there's just some stuff you got to learn, right? Yeah, yeah, you, you just got to learn those things, right? Yeah, I, I, I have to tell you, that's another time. I can't tell you that, but, but yeah. So, so we, 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 we obey laws, not because we love our country so much, but we're so fearful of the punishment. So that's a punitive fear. The word fear, whether it's, it means the same thing, it means reverence or respect. Okay, and so here's saying now that we need to have reverence and respect for the Lord. But what kind if he doesn't want us to have punitive fear? And most of us, even in our relationship with God, that's how it is. It's a punitive relationship. You don't do certain things against the word of God because you're afraid of the punishment. It's not. Yeah, you're afraid that, well, you know, he says I ought not do this because this could happen or that could happen. And I used to I used to fear God in that way, too. I, you know, I, w- I used to fear him for what I thought he might do to me if he caught me, not knowing he already saw it. <laughs> yeah. See, I used to think I was smart enough that so God didn't see me do it. Are y'all walking with me here? But now, notice now, he, he, he delivered them, right? He saved them, and it says it wasn't until they saw their problem dead that they feared the Lord. So if it's not a punitive fear that God wants, the next kind of fear is a parental fear. Now, this, I'm talking about healthy parental fear. Many of us don't want to disappoint our parents. How many of you like making your parents happy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to love making my parents happy, so I snuck and did a lot of things they didn't want me to do. Because I didn't want them, you know, I, yeah, I, I did it. You, you, you. Thank you. I, okay. I, now, I brought home good grades so they could look at my grades and wouldn't look at the other stuff I was doing. But I used to hate when they went to PTA. Y'all remember when parents used to go to PTA? I, as soon as I heard that door cracked, I would go to sleep. <sighs> My daddy said, we're going to wake him up anyway. I thought good grades were enough. I didn't know it mattered if you cut up in class or not. You're right? The teacher would be, they wouldn't tell him about how good my work was. All they would say is, he won't sit down. He's always talking. He's... Y'all don't believe that, do you? But I wanted to please my parents. I wanted them to be proud of me. How many of you want your parents to be proud of you? So you have a respect and reverence for them, not out of fear, but out of love. And the things God asks us to do for him is not for our salvation, but it's to show that we love him. That's why he gave them the the Ten Commandments. Yeah, the commandments don't save us. God is saying, if you want to show me how much you love me, then follow my word. Now, now watch this. But the reason he wants us to follow them is not to keep us from having fun, but so you can have some good fun and the right fun. It, it, so, so that he's, he's showing you where the boundaries are, where evil can attack you. He says, now, when you go outside of these boundaries here, it's like a fence yard. He said, you're going to put yourself in harm's way. Are y'all walking with me here? And, and, and because of that, he's telling them. Now, here, that's chapter 20 of Exodus. You got to go back and read that yourself. He tells us to have no other God before him. Why? Because he just defeated their problem. He's saying that I'm the baddest thing on the planet. Now, see, here's the thing. Most of us look at God as an equalizer. How many of y'all seen equalizer too? Oh, yeah, it's all right to raise your hand. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good movie, isn't it? Yeah, I can't, it's not, okay, all right, that's your opinion. <coughs> but anyway, 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 but, but, but equalizer uh, is, 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 Denzel plays the part where he's balancing the scales. 
And most of us look at God as an equalizer. God is not an equalizer. We don't need to look at him to come in and balance the scales. We need to look at him as the creator, the one over our problems, the one that's higher than anything that we're going through, the one that has all power that can make everything all right when he wants to. But sometimes he needs us to learn a lesson. And until we learn that lesson that we can trust him, then we can't, we, 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 we can't, we, we haven't learned it, so he keeps putting us through some things. Now, watch this now. Watch this. So he says that they feared him. So now he's wanting them to have a parental fear. That's the kind of fear he wants us to have. He wants us to do the things he's written in his word, not to try to stop us from having a good life. It's absolutely the opposite. And so he's wanting us to have that healthy parental fear that he is a God that can take care of all of your problems, not just some of them. How many of you got some problems other than me? Just a few of you? Okay, all of y'all who don't have any problems, wait till tomorrow. They coming, they coming, they coming. It's okay if you don't have any right now, but they're coming. But when they do come, if we're, we're, if we're in God's word and we're in his will and we're in his way, God says, I got this. All right, God says, I got this. I know some of you are facing stuff. And, and, and I've been amazed that during this series, how many of you have come to me with the things you've been going through? It's not an accident. It's not a coincidence. It's by God's divine providence that you are where you are. So I'm just want to encourage you. You just hold on. That's why I say the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom? Just, just, just write down everything that you fear and you put the Lord over top of that. Yeah, and as you've heard me say this before. Stop telling God about your problems and tell your problems about your God. You tell your problems how big your God is, how powerful your God is, how he's got all power in heaven and on earth, that he's got all knowledge. There's nothing he does not know and there's nothing he cannot fix, that he's anywhere and everywhere, that you st- but, 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 but this is when we have to envision God's uh, enveloping presence, that we have to believe that he's all those things. We fall apart when we stop believing them and start looking at our problems and think that our problems can take us out. Now, you're going to die. That's a problem. But that's not the end for us. He says that's our last enemy. Last enemy. Are y'all walking with me here? So, so now watch this now. What happens when you have the fear of the Lord? Here's your life advice. The fear of the Lord, and I don't have time to give you all of this. I'm just going to give you a snippet of it. The fear of the Lord brings the favor of the Lord. Did you know that? When you're in a healthy, right relationship with God, it's going to bring his favor. How many of you want God's favor? Yes, indeed. How do I know that? When you go back to that uh, chapter 19, verses 4 through 6, did he not say that you are my treasured possession? Is it not, not what that text says in there? That, that, when, that means God says, I'm going to do for you what I'm not going to do for anybody else. I can do for you because you're mine. That's personal. That ought to be good for somebody to know that you belong to him and that he's going to show you some favor. I like that. I like that God shows me favor. Favor, this is not good English, but it's good theology. Favor ain't fair. So for those of you who may be visiting with us, it's it's not good English. Don't be saying he doesn't know how to speak. No, I I know this doesn't even sound right. Favor isn't fair. that's, That's grammatically correct. But favor ain't fair. Now that's got some punch to it, right? You can walk, you can work with that, can't you? That's right. That's, that's what favor is. So what does favor mean? Favor means exactly that, favor. Meaning that God's going to do for you what he may not do for anybody else but for you. Yeah, you're, you can sit down on that one for a while. But I don't have a while. I only have about a few more minutes here. So let me just help you understand this last part about faith. Now, this is the other lesson that he wanted them to learn. He wanted them to have faith. Where's my chair? Let me have a chair. Let me have that chair right there. Yeah, just this one right here. Well, no, let me have the one he's sitting in right there. Yeah, let me move up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 
going to show you what faith is. How many of you got faith? Yeah, you got faith in more stuff than you know. You got more faith than your doctor who writes on a piece of paper stuff you can't understand. You take it to a place and hand it to a person you don't even know. They give you some pills that you take home, and it tells you what to take on the body, and you pop them bad boy. Pop, 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 pop. That's faith. To me, that's crazy, but that, y'all call it faith. But that's faith. How many got faith in your car? Yeah, you do. You go out every morning, and you just turn that bad boy, broom, and when it doesn't start, you like, you get an attitude. Don't you know I got to go to work and you got the audacity not to start this morning? You got confidence. You don't pull up the hood. You don't sit there and try to figure it out. In fact, most of you don't even know how it operates. All you know, you push a button or turn a key and it starts. Up. That's faith. That's faith. The Bible says that they feared the Lord. That's the first thing. They had respect and reverence for him. And then it says they put their trust in the Lord. Now that word put trust in means they had faith. They started believing that God could do what he said he was going to do. Notice now, he said he was going to do it, but they didn't believe it. So, so faith is not as much as uh, uh, believing what you have not experienced. It's believing what you have experienced. God said it, but now God did it. So my question is now, I saw somebody sitting in that chair. The question is, do I have faith that I can sit in that chair? Do I have faith that this chair going to hold me up? Is that what y'all come in and do every morning? I've seen some of you. How many of you take that much time to even talk about a chair? Do you know what would happen to your back and your butt if you just dropped right down on the floor? We, we don't have any insurance, so don't even think about it. Hmm. Do I have confidence that this chair is going to do, watch this now, what it's designed to do? Ah, ah, ah. Is that chair going to be able to keep me from falling? Is that chair going to be able to protect my back while I'm sitting at it and keep me held up when I need to be? I, 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 I'm just afraid, y'all, uh, to sit in this chair. And, and because some of us are that way, we're afraid to trust the Lord. And, and, and God is wanting to do something for you. But, but you're just walking around. God is right there. And all he wants you to do is just to put your trust in him. But, but you're afraid, so you're trying to keep working things out on your own and trying to fix your own situation. You keep doing it over and over and over. And God is right there. He says, I've got the power. I'm designed to protect you. All I need you to do, as Jesus says in Matthew, the 11th chapter, he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and, and, I, and I, 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 I will give you rest. And he said that you can sit down in me and that you can trust that I can take care of you. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what's got you all messed up in your head, but if you're just Sit down and put your confidence in him. And if you would just exercise your faith and say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I know why. Because you woke me up this morning. Or you started me on my way. Lord, you didn't allow my bed to be my cooling board or my sheet, my shrine. Lord, I'm just going to put my faith in you because you got all power in heaven and on earth. And all I got to do is trust him. I don't know how. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm just foolish enough to trust you. I'm just foolish enough that you're going to give me what I stand in need of. I, I just said, Lord, I, I love you now because you got all power in heaven and on earth. And I'm just foolish enough to exercise my faith and walk with him even when I can't see how things are going to turn out I don't know what tomorrow holds but I know who holds tomorrow he's got the whole world he's got the whole world he's got the whole world he's got your world and your world and your world 
in your world and your world. He's got it in his hand. Hold on. Hold on. 